Good evening, everybody. Uh, fantastic to have you all on us on this evening um, for uh, our webinar, uh, which we'll look at just to give us a better understanding about the menstrual cycle for, for our players. Um, brilliant to see so many people on. Um, we have people on here who I think are coaches, and in particular, we have a number of people on who are players. So just brilliant to have you on for this evening, and we really hope you get a couple of nuggets of information out of it. My own name is Lizzie Flynn, and I'm the National Development Officer for Player and Referee Education uh, with the LGFA. And I have with me tonight uh, Esther Goldsmith. Esther's from Oracle by trade. She's a sports scientist, and it's just fantastic to have you, Esther, on tonight to kind of share your knowledge and to kind of give us a, a better understanding of that and how that applies for us as, as, as footballers and as players. Um, there is a Q&A box. If you have any questions, as basic as you think they are, to put them in, I'll monitor that and we'll get to either during it or even at the end. Um, or if you have any comments that you'd like to make, please feel free to, to do, do this at any stage throughout. So hand over to you, Esther. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lizzie. And thank you to the, the LGFA for having me this evening. Um, thank you also for thank you to everyone um for logging in. Um, as Lizzie said, my name's Esther um, and I am a sports scientist working for Orico, who are a data science and sports science company. And at Orico, we have a kind of big female athlete focus um, and I work as both a practitioner and a researcher within with female athletes, individuals, sports. Um, and I guess a lot of that is to do with kind of the menstrual cycle and hormones and how you can really unlock this female athlete potential. Um, so I'm going to be taking you through um, some slides, some education, some things. But actually, before we get going, oh, hang on. There we go. Before we get going, I've got a little quiz. So if you've um, got phones, um, then if you could take a little snapshot of that QR code. We all have a QR code at the moment. Um, or you can go to this link, um, copy and paste that you can kind of type it in. Um, then there's a there's a few questions on there. Um, and I would I'm gonna show them up um in a second. And um hopefully if I have sorted this right, then I can present um the results so if you kind of it, it should be activated now so i'm gonna share the results with you there we go okay so lots of people looking on if you could answer that first question Okay, oh, oh, presenter, there we go. Okay, so there should be, you should get 40 seconds, but it might go quicker than that. It might actually just be 15. So, oh, there we go, 40 seconds to answer this question. Sorry, I should have uh, pressed start first. <laughs> there we go. So if you haven't managed to, um, to find, use the QR code, the link is at the top of here, so you can use that. So menti.com and then there's a little code. There we go. Okay, so actually it's 450. So average on average, a female has 450 match cycles throughout her whole life. So pretty, pretty, there's quite a lot of menstrual cycles. So second question. Oh, there we go. So how many females in the world are menstruating today? So today, the 30th of November, how many do you think are menstruating? So how many are on their period? 30 seconds. So you've got 60. Oh, there we go. Everyone's done it. Okay, so eight, 800 million. Well done to those three that got it right. Um, bit of a guess, but it's quite a lot. I hope you'll agree. And then the last question, just to get you a little warmed up. Okay. 
Okay, how many sanitary products does the average female need throughout her or their life? So how many sanitary products do you think we get through on average? There is a bit of a range, so, um, but one of the answers on here, so 6,000, 9,000, 11,000 and 13,000. There we go. So actually it's between 12,000 and 15,000, which again is a lot but it, it kind of just gets you thinking oh gosh like this is something significant for females um okay let's go back to the presentation so we like menstrual cycles are significant for females and i think that's not always appreciated in sport and when we think about female athletes, there are lots of things that um, we have to consider. So there's nutrition, performance, um, sorry, nutrition, sleep, recovery, there's training load, there's um, environmental factors, traveling around, there's lots of kind of psychological factors that go into being an athlete, but all of these are really linked with our female health. So that menstrual cycle, um, you know, these, these five, I guess, um, sub uh, topics can impact um, our health and our female health or so our menstrual cycle and our hormonal fluctuations in the cycle can impact those things and this, so we get this bi-directional relationship but if we really optimize everything around to support our health then that we believe um, kind of can lead to optimal performance. So you can be your best on any one day. Now I'm going to take you back a little bit. So a little bit of a history lesson as to why I'm asking you, why we're asking you this and we're talking about it in 2022. So if we go back to the 1900s, so over 100 years ago, in the Paris Olympic Games in 1900, only 22 females competed. Not very, not very many. So that was 2% of all participants. So females weren't really in sport then. And actually they were deemed as protected subjects, which meant that in, in this time, so between 1900 and about the 1980s, there wasn't much research done on females because females were banned from actually by participating in research studies. And you may not be aware, but of what happens in sports science research has a very direct effect to practice. And so if females weren't being kind of um, measured, all research was being done on men and then considerations and guidelines and you know best practices were written from these research studies in men, not considering the fact that females might be different. But then after the um, feminist movement, some women started to be like, actually, we're different. You know, we are females and we're not the same as males. And so and then in 1993, there was this Nas National Institute of Health Revitalization Act, which um, actually made research and researchers consider females, thank thankfully. But that was still kind of almost 30 years ago. Um, and if we cut to the millennium, so in Rio and in Tokyo, we've had an incredible, um, I guess, jump in the amount of participants since those 1900s. And we're near, we're about almost at half, which is great, but it hasn't been long. Um, this kind of whole timeline hasn't been very long. And so we're still really understanding, we're still developing practices that are female specific. And one of those things, like, we, re as I said, we really believe that if we do this, we can re reach optimal performance and we can keep pushing and keep progressing and keep this timeline going. And so I think what the, the thing that we're suddenly realizing, thankfully, is that females are not just males. They're not just small males with different reproductive organs. You know, there's lots of different things that females are different. So our immune system is different. So, um, lots of kind of illnesses have different rates in both fe in females compared to males and COVID-19 being one of those we see that actually less females have um, contracted the virus compared to males. Our neurological control is different so the way that we kind of our nervous system talks to 
um, the rest of our body is different and that feeds into our biomechanics. So actually the way we move is fundamentally different between females and males. And that's also linked as well as um, linked to our neuro neurological system that's linked to our skeletal system. So females have different um, I guess it's like angles. And one of the most obvious ones is at our hips. So our hip bones are at different angles uh, in our pelvis compared to males. Our muscular development is different. And you may notice this if you did the same strength training um, can, as, a, as your male counterpart, you'd get different results. You get different muscular development. And that's because our muscles are different. Like we typically have uh, diff muscles in different areas compared to males. Um, we have smaller hearts and smaller blood, and like less blood volume flowing around our body. Our metabolism is different. And so the way we use food for fuel and energy is different to males. And that's not always considered, particularly in sport, when nutrition is so important. The way we thermoregulate, so the way we heat our body and cool our body is also different. And a lot of these things are linked with the fact that we have different hormones. So primarily females have high levels of estrogen and progesterone and males have higher levels of testosterone. And that brings me really nicely into the menstrual cycle. So we talked about how many menstrual cycles a female has in her lifetime, and it's quite a lot. But have you ever really thought about it? Have you thought about the whole cycle? Have you thought about what your cycle, how your cycle might impact you as an athlete, you as a female? And that's what I'm here about to talk to you about, I guess. And so these hormones, so the estrogen and progesterone that I said that females have a lot more of compared to males, they travel in the body. So they are secreted by the ovaries, um, but they travel in the bloodstream. And actually we found, researchers found receptors for these hormones in the brain, in the heart, in the muscles, um, around your bones. And that means that they can impact all of those things. Um, so these hormones have a, have a really strong impact. And they fluctuate. And because they fluctuate, some of them are at high concentrations compared to others. And sometimes they're high and sometimes they're low. And the fact that they are high or low can affect all of those systems that I said that they, they can impact. And so we need to really appreciate the cycle as a whole cycle, not just thinking about our period um, or maybe the days just before. Actually, it's like, you know, 28 or it could be 35 days of hormonal, hormonal fluctuations. And you can see here, the main kind of um, hormones involved are progesterone, so that's the pink line, um, estrogen or estradiol, which is the blue line. And then we've also got FSH and LH. And FSH and LH are important hormones, they're really important for reproduction, um, but they don't have the same effect as estrogen or estradiol and progesterone. So those are the two that I'm going to focus on um, throughout the rest of the talk. Okay, so before I get, there's lots of kind of components to this presentation. I thought I'd talk you through the menstrual cycle because I don't know about you, but when I first was taught probably the only time I was properly taught about it was in the school and I definitely didn't listen. Um, so I'm going to take you back a little bit. So we've done history now, we're on to biology. So um, we actually split the menstrual cycle into four phases. So at Orico, we have an app called Fit a Woman um, and Fit a Woman tells you which phase you're in and various things related to it. And I will show you the app um, in, a, in a while. Um, but we split the app, the cycle into four phases in the app so that you can really understand what's happening in each phase. And it's based on what your hormones are doing at each particular time. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit, but there are loads of other things and loads more information on the app. So I do encourage you to check that out. So phase one is the start of a cycle. So that's your period or when you're bleeding. Um, day one is your first, the first day of your period. And at this time, both estrogen and progesterone are low because they've fallen at the end of the previous cycle. And because of this decline in hormones, so the fact that they're low, 
this might mean that we have higher levels of baseline inflammation. So you might feel kind of symptoms like lower back pain. Um, you might feel quite tired. Um, you might have kind of muscle aches or, or cramps. And that's probably to do with this inflammatory response. You might also have stomach cramps at this time or changes in mood or cravings. So there are lots of symptoms that it's important to be aware of that can happen during phase one. The other thing that can happen though is that you feel really great. And you know, world records have been broken in phase one on your pe on people's periods, so it shouldn't hold you back. Um, but it's about you know knowing what is phase one for you, and I think that's the really important thing that I want to hammer home is that everyone is individual, and there's no one size fits all thing. You've got to understand what's going on in your cycle in your body. Now, after phase one finishes, so at the end of your period, you move into phase two, obviously. Um, and during phase two, estrogen increases. So that blue line you can see goes up to a really nice peak. And estrogen is a great hormone because um, it's linked with this increase in serotonin and dopamine, which are feel-good hormones, um, can allow you to feel great and to push on. Um, and that's really good. And we want to, you know, potentially use this as a good opportunity to to crack on to feel good to push maybe it's in the gym maybe it's um in your life you've got more energy and motivation um, there are some considerations in phase two too you know if you're going to push on you might need to do a little bit more, more of a thorough warm-up um, you may need to make sure you're adequately fueling because appetite can be a little bit suppressed here so there's lots of other considerations but it, it's usually a pretty good phase for most people and towards the end of phase two, um, you can see the blue line dips a little bit, and that's because you then get this peak in LH, so the green line, um, of, and that is your body preparing for ovulation. And so phase two ends with ovulation. And from ovulation, you move into phase, that's kind of signifies to your body, okay, I've moved on, I'm in the new phase now, and you're in phase three, or the start of the luteal phase. And during phase three, progesterone, so the pink line, really increases. And estrogen is also high. But because this progesterone increase causes an increase in um, core body temperature or basal body temperature, and that is actually um, how some fertility apps track um, and things like natural cycles, if you've heard of it, or um, other apps, they kind of, they use a thermometer to track your core body temperature to tell you whether you've ovulated or not. Um, this increase in temperature can also um, happen alongside a slight increase in resting heart rate or exercising heart rate um, and also ventilatory rate. Um, it, you know, it's, it's just it's another there's some considerations that go alongside it. So there's some nutritional considerations related to the fact that um, progesterone can cause a slight increase in muscle breakdown. So how you, how you uh, work your nutrition around your hormones um, is really important. And again, we'll come on to that in a bit. And there's loads of information in for women around that. And towards the end of phase three, so your body um, is then if a preg if a um sorry if pregnancy hasn't happened so if fertilization of the egg hasn't happened after ovulation then the body's like okay we've got to shut this down we're gonna um get rid of the lining of the endometrium that's built up and so your hormones drop off really quickly so you get this decline in progesterone and in estrogen um which causes the um, lining of the endometrium to shed, which is then your period. But during phase four, because of this decline in hormone, it's a very significant thing for your body. You know, it's been used to these high levels of hormones and then suddenly they're taken away and your body's like, whoa. Um, and so again, you get this increase um, in inflammation, which is also linked to the fact that the endometrium is about to break down. And that can, again can cause symptoms. We often see um, the withdrawal of hormone related to kind of mood changes. That's a really common um, symptom, but also fatigue, um, again, lower back pain, um, cravings that's linked with kind of changes in blood sugar levels. So there's, there's some symptoms that can happen in this phase four. And we're going to talk about them a little bit and how you can manage those symptoms because they are what may hold you back, but we don't want that to happen. So I've talked about a cycle and, you know, 
what happens throughout the cycle, but actually what's a normal menstrual cycle. So there's some characteristics that I look for um, as a practitioner in athletes that I work with, and you should be aware of to to denote what a normal menstrual cycle is. So whilst lots of people talk about having a period every month or uh, a menstrual cycle is is every 28 days, that's actually just an average. So a normal menstrual cycle is between 21 and 35 days in length. And in that, you should have a period that lasts three to eight days. We also look for a consistent cycle length. So you're not hopping around between a 22 and a 34 day cycle. Um, We try to look for as little variation as possible. And we don't want to see any excessive blood loss, so no heavy menstrual bleeding, um, and we don't want debilitating symptoms either. So all if you know, we'll talk about red. I'll talk about red flags in a sec. Um, but these are all kind of what I I see as a as a normal menstrual cycle. Good to go. Let's see how we can optimize then around that. And I said not um, debilitating symptoms because I think also what you do need to realize is that you know, we're only just understanding this area and actually lots of people do suffer from symptoms. Um, and so in the media over the last seven seven years, so this was um, in 2015, so it's just over seven years now, um, our female athletes from all over the shop, so tennis, running, um, golf, and there's more tennis there as well, um, have been kind of speaking out, which is great. We want to be speaking about menstrual cycles. We want to be talking about periods. It shouldn't be a taboo. But they've been saying that they they felt held back because of their symptoms related to their menstrual cycle. And I fundamentally believe that that should not be the case and we should be able to manage them. But it's about being savvy around your menstrual cycle. Um, you always say that female athletes love to be prepared, but they fail to prepare for their period. So I think that's one thing that we, you know, we can do and we can work on this. But hopefully if my if I do my job right at the end when I retire, uh, there won't be these headlines anymore because We'll have we'll be able to manage this, and we won't. They won't be causing kind of female athletes at the top of their game um, to be to have to sacrifice on performance. Okay, so those symptoms, you know, doesn't paint a great picture of of menstrual cycles. So why should I have one? Uh, was a good question. Um, and I think there can have a there can be a time when someone if someone doesn't have their period for a bit, then it's like great. Um, they don't have to deal with the worrying about it. But actually, a regular menstrual cycle, even if it comes with some symptoms, is so important for your long term and and sometimes your short term health. Actually, often your short term health. And that's because it shows that you've got energy. So it's not just linked with reproduction, even though reproduction is great. Um, But I work with lots of, you know, 20 year olds who don't really aren't bothered about fertility right now. And so actually it's a sign of other things. We use this kind of dial of readiness, I guess you could say this dial is. So it shows that you have sufficient energy available for your life. It shows that you can grow and repair. Um, So if you get a cut, you can repair that. You can heal like scar tissue will form, like normal physiological processes. It's linked to having a regular cycle is linked with a reduction of risk of injury um, and illness and injury rates, particularly thinking about your bone structure and your bone mineral density. A regular cycle is really important for that. It's linked with, so as I said, illness, but immune function. So it shows that you've got having a cycle, regular cycle shows to me that you've got energy to fight off illnesses, to fight off viruses or bacteria or anything that's going to be threatening to your body. It shows that you can heat and cool yourself kind of how you should. And lastly, for, for athletes particularly, or for anyone in sport and exercise, I guess, it shows that you can adapt and respond to that training. So you're doing some training to get better, to improve. That's ultimately what, what we train for, um, especially as an individual. So thinking about kind of gym work as opposed to maybe on pitch stuff is a bit different. Um, but it shows to me that you've got energy to to do that, to do that training and then respond to it and get better or faster or stronger or more flexible or um all of the above um, 
compared to what you were doing before. And so if, you, if I said, if you don't have a menstrual cycle, so if your energy is, um, if your body isn't having this regular sign, there are some red flags to, to kind of give a little hint that something's not quite right. So one of those things is cycle length extension. So if your cycle, it suddenly becomes longer and longer and longer and longer, that's a red flag to me because it might mean that ovulation isn't happening. Very, very heavy periods. So frequently changing your um, sanitary protection, having to use double protection, frequently bleeding through onto bedding or clothing, those kind of things. That's a sign that something's not quite right. Actually might lead to, might be because of an underlying menstrual dysfunction erratic cycle length so no no consistency in how long your um, menstrual cycle is that's a red flag to me as is debilitating symptoms so but symptoms that mean you can't get out of bed you have to miss training you have to maybe you have to miss a, a competition or a match um that's a red flag for sure and there are some reasons why um, these things might be going on. And one of those is because the menstrual cycle is governed on this really tight axis. So your um, brain is linked with your ovaries, essentially. Um, and so if you get a stressor in your life or you um, put a stressor on your body and your physiology, that is detected by your hypothalamus. So your hypothalamus is in your brain. And your brain detects this stressor. You can see it, it pulsated there. And so then your brain is like, whoa, there's stress. Hang on a sec, something's not quite right. So it sends messages down to your pituitary gland, which is just below the, the base of your um, brain. And your pituitary gland is what's responsible for the release of estrogen and progesterone. And so it sends signals down to your ovaries to say, hang on a sec, there's some stress, whether it's physiological stress, I'll talk what kind of stresses there are in a sec. Um, I've said that a lot recently, sorry, a sec. Um, <laughs> if your, your pituitary gland says signals down and says stop the release or alter the release of estrogen and progesterone because something's not quite right. And actually menstrual reproduction or menstrual cycle is a really good thing, but it's not essential for you to survive. Um, it's essential for the next generation um, potentially, but not for you. So your body's like, hang on, we'll do, we'll do that later. We will focus on the fundamentals, which are things like breathing, um, moving, um, think about what you'd need to do if there was a tiger running after you. That's what it focuses on. And so those stresses that I just mentioned, some of those are obvious and some of them are not so. So one of them is psychological stress. So um, increased psychological stress, maybe that's linked with anxiety or depression or any other kind of mood, um, altered mood state um, can re be really kind of um, traumatic for, for you and for your body. And so things like grief and moving house or um, exam load, or a competition, or a job interview, or um, not being able to afford things, and worrying because of that, all of those things can impact your menstrual cycle, because of your body is, is so stressed that it has this increase in cortisol, which then shuts the cycle down. Another thing that's a big stressor is is is, is activity, is energy. So um, your cycle can be impacted by how little training you do. So if you lead a sedentary lifestyle um, and you don't do much exercise, that can make your cycle different. Um, but also if you're if you're doing kind of too much for your body, so that might be not recovering, not making not taking the time to recover doing too much high intensity back to back might be suddenly stepping up your um your training load that is stressful for your body because it's suddenly got to do so much more movement and exert so much more energy and repair and growth that it it can shut the the cycle down or it can change symptoms as well that's another thing i think we need to appreciate it's not just uh causing a halt to your cycle it's um, or extending it or stopping ovulation it's also could change symptoms and make them really bad travel is another one so travel um, often comes hand in hand with changes in circadian rhythm so if you're especially if you're going across time zones and having jet lag and things like that um, that can 
your body doesn't know which way is up or down, let alone um, know what to do with the hormone release. So that can really affect and things like shift work as well, we've seen um, can be related to um, menstrual cycle abnormalities. And lastly, fueling. So if you're not fueling enough for your lifestyle, your sport, your exercise, um, then your body will be in a kind of fight or flight state. Um, and that can cause your cycle to, to change, to stop or to, to change in kind of characteristics. But similarly, if you're not eating kind of the right amount of um, fat that your body needs or you're not eating loads of minerals and macronutrients, micronutrients, then that can cause changes in your menstrual cycle. OK, so myth busting. So I for some reason, I can't see the chat, but I'm just going to quickly I'm going to open it. Um, if I escape this, then I can see it. Okay, I can look in your chat, and what would be great is if you could say, if I'm going to say, I'll say them rather than, um, let's actually see, it stays open, great. Okay, so if you could give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So a thumbs up, you think this is true, and a thumbs down, you think this is false. Um, if this doesn't work, then don't worry, then we'll just skip through these, but I thought I'd try a little bit of interaction again. So if you, can, if you can't swim when you're on your period, if you think that's true, give me a thumbs up on your in the webinar chat. And if you think it's false, then give me a thumbs down. If everyone else has switched off, then we'll just skip the... <laughs> Shy people, Esther, so... Uh, okay, thanks, Lizzie. Okay. I'll I'll just I'll just talk us through these. I'll 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 uh, I'll skip the participation, which is fine. Well, I encourage you, just, even if you all don't want to engage a little bit, this is a for us this is a very safe environment. So um look, please feel free to you know involve yourselves as much as you can with questions or polls or anything yeah. like that because it's brilliant when we have someone um as knowledgeable as Esther on with us. So um yeah, thank you again, Esther. Thanks, Lizzie. Okay, so in your head, if you don't want to engage with uh, putting in an emoji, um, you can't swim when you're in your period. So it's actually it's actually um, false. So um, you can swim when you're in your period. It's just about having the right protection. But I think lots of people, particularly if you um, haven't been menstruating for very long, lots of people think this is um, this is true, and so they stop swimming. Um, but actually, no, swimming is great when you're on your period because it's it can make you feel better because you, you're moving, um, but you don't have the impact. You don't have the up and down in your body in the same way. Well, there's a little Q and A there. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I just have a look. There's a few saying that the chat is disabled, so I just. Uh, oh, I there we go. That would be why. <laughs> uh, can you can go ahead for now, and I'll try and uh, fix. Okay, that. let's go for the second one. So, having an irregular cycle is normal because you're an athlete or you do lots of exercise. Let's see if that works. So, try the emoji thing. Okay. Don't worry, we'll just skip through it. I'll, I'll just talk through people. People can get my myth busting um, tips. Okay, so this is, again, this is false. So um, having a record, you can be a, an elite athlete at, an athlete at the top of your game. Um, you can go to the gym every day, but having an irregular cycle is not a part of this. You can have a regular menstrual cycle and still be an athlete. So those things do go hand in hand. Um, I've had lots of unfortunate uh, things from coming from slightly archaic coaches saying that if you're not training hard enough, then you'll have your period. If you're training, if you still have, if you, sorry, if you um, have your period, you're not training hard enough. And that's just fundamentally not true. Painful periods are just a part of being female. So again, not true. You'll see a theme. Um, I was going to say, yes, just, just to maybe get a bit yeah. involved, I just couldn't find that set there at the minute. So if you can still use the actual Q&A, so if they want to put it into the okay, Q &A, yeah, that will actually work as well. They might not be able to see it, but you and I would be able to see what kind of people are saying. So I think that would uh, work well for the minute, actually. Okay. So if you can type in the Q&A, hang on, can I enable this? Yeah. 
Well, um, I'm just on the send anyway, so. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. I mean, I think I feel like I'll I'll just um I'll just crack on. It's okay. <laughs> Go through these. Training fasted will help me lose weight. I wonder how many of you um think that that is true. Um, if you can type in the Q and A, then please do. Um, I think I have the chat open here actually, so people might just let us know and even test that. That'd be great. Okay. So I, yeah. Or if you can, if you can try the chat. Yeah, we have uh, one or two. Yeah, there we go. The chat is is now enabled. So if you can put a thumbs up if you think that training fasted will help you lose weight, and a thumbs down if you think that it won't. There we go. Two, thank you, Eileen. And I did see there was another one on the Q&A, so that's great, thank you. Um, it's an interesting one. And as a female, I can tell you it will not help you lose weight um, unless you are of a clinical population or, um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so actually, Training fasted can cause an increase in cortisol because you have high levels of cortisol in the morning anyway. And then if you train on top of that, particularly high intensity training without having any food, then your cortisol is just going to build and build and build. And this increase in cortisol over time can cause um, your menstrual cycle to stop. And if you don't have a menstrual cycle, your body's not going to want to lose weight because it's like I'm I'm in fight and flight mode. I need to um, hold on to all of the weight because I don't know when I'm going to get fed again. Um, so that's kind of the, the signaling that goes on. Okay, your period starts on the same day each month. Hopefully you've been listening to what I've been saying. Thumbs up for true, thumbs down for not true. There we go. Lizzie's on it, she's been listening to me. <laughs> Which is nice, yeah. Thumbs down for sure. Nice one. Um, yeah, as I said, it can be 21 to 35 days in length. Um, so not just every month. And you can perform when you, to your best when you're on your period. Thumbs up for true, thumbs down for not true. There we go, thumbs up all the way. That was a one to catch you out since everything else would be not true. Yes, you can perform to your best when you're in your period. It's just about knowing what you need to do in case if you if you are struggling at that time. Okay, and that brings me on to understanding what your cycle means to you. So we have this app, which I've been talking to you about. Uh, or telling you about briefly Fitter Women. It is free to download um, and on the App Store and on Google Play. And it breaks the cycle down based on your um, kind of historic dates um, and your average length of your cycle and things like that into four phases. And it tells you what's going on in each phase in terms of your physiology, what kind of nutritional considerations or training considerations there are in each phase, um, but it also allows you to track your cycle, to track any symptoms, so that over time you can see um, patterns and trends that uh, occur in your own cycle. We also have a whole range of uh, recipes. Some of them were actually written by um, an LGF, LG, uh, good, <laughs> sorry, but it's late, a football player. Um, so Sinead... Um, she wrote some of the recipes there um, and I encourage you to go check it out and we are excitingly having a new version of this coming out next year which has a whole host of other features and you can save for using contraception that kind of thing um, so yeah there's brand new spanking fit women coming next year but for now um, I encourage you to go and go and download it if you don't already have it there's loads of information in it as well kind of gold and so by tracking you know you can you can be aware of all of these things and their impact on your female health and how your hormone fluctuations impact them all and so hopefully over time you can really achieve more you can jump higher you can run faster you can 
get to your A game like um, all of these athletes that we've worked with in the past. But one of the things that kind of thinking about practical things, so what can you do to to reduce um, risk of symptoms, to reduce risk of having a menstrual dysfunction or cycle irregularity. And so I'm gonna whiz through these quite quickly because I'm aware of time and I want to leave um, some time at the end for questions. But making sure you've got the right things in your diet. So having anti-inflammatory foods. So that's things like um, olive oils, nuts and seeds, oily fish, but also fruit and vegetables, um, all of that good stuff. Having seven to 10 portions a day is gonna really help you and set you up for success. Fueling regularly as well. So aiming to fuel every two to four hours um, can keep your hormones happy and on a regular cycle. Including high fiber options and whole grains is super important, particularly when energy levels are prone to spiking and dipping. And I can't see that because the chat is in the way. Sorry, I'm just going to escape. I should know this off by heart, but <laughs> reducing um, intake of oil, of um, saturated fats and processed foods as well as going to keep your hormone release happy and not cause too many, uh, too much kind of changes in other hormones. And our top tip, my top tip for today is also to stay hydrated. Remember hydration alongside your nutrition. Um, and if you're having, if it's really, really sweaty, then have an electrolyte to keep your electrolytes balanced. Um, and we know that at certain times of the cycle, you're more prone to kind of dehydration and different electrolyte fluids loss. Um, so do, again, do track back on Fitzwilliam to find out when that is. In terms of recovery, so in phases one and four, when I said you had this increase in inflammation, actually getting more sleep can be really helpful because your body's working a lot harder in those phases. You can use a, system, a consistent sleep routine for this. So making sure you're going to bed and waking up at the same times every day helps your body, but also kind of prepping it. So having a routine that you do every night to prep your body for sleep and get it ready is important. And then into that, you can include a pre-bed protein serving. So something like yogurt with some berries is great because it's going to help your body recover. Um, and we know there's times in the cycle, menstrual cycle, where your recovery might be impacted by your hormone so having uh, this this protein before bed with some berries is um, a really great idea then and trying some mindfulness and meditation can really help with symptom management particularly those mood symptoms that lots of us get premenstrually I am definitely one of those um, and again my top tip for this phase is to to focus on those recovery strategies particularly in those times when recovery might be impacted by your hormones and that's phases one and four and again, whizzing through this, so I apologize for the speed if you're taking notes, but uh, you can always ask me a bit more uh, later in the Q&A. In terms of your lifestyle, style, so we want you to be proactive around time zone shifts. So those can really impact your hormones, as I said. So maybe if you know you're going to travel across eight time zones, then um, try to shift your body clock or just be really aware, book a certain flight that means that you can get enough sleep Stress is one of those things that can really impact our hormones. It can make symptoms worse. It can cause changes in cycle length. It can cause kind of absent cycles. Um, and so really finding um, a way to manage that stress for you is important. Maybe that's reaching out, talking to a friend or doing some something kind of self-care related um, every day is, um, is really advised. Moving and stretching throughout the day. So, you know, you, you might really prioritize your training or exercise, but if you're then just sitting, your body is, can, it's almost like that inflammation can build up when you're sitting. It's just not quite true, but um, keeping moving and stretching, especially if you have kind of things like lower back pain at certain times of your cycle is important. And don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. If any of those red flags um, uh, uh apply to you then do make sure you ask for help don't just sit suffer in silence we're great at doing that as females but that's not what I want to encourage I want you to encourage you to talk out and you can track and use your tracking to reach out if something's not quite right um but tracking can also help you understand your cycle so you know what each phase means for you uh, and what normal is for you Okay, last little bit before I, I wrap up. Um, 
I thought I'd just mention hormonal contraception. So we know that about 50% of the population use some kind of contraceptive, um, hormonal contraceptive. And there are actually different, lots of different types. And I think that's not always appreciated. I definitely didn't know before I worked, it started working in this area of, of um, female athletes. And so the most common one is the combined pill. So the, the pill um, or the OCP, um, that contains um, a synthetic form of estrogen and progesterone. But we also have a progestin only pill or the mini pill, we have a hormonal IUD or the Mirena coil, uh, an implant, a patch, an injection, a vaginal ring, that there's lots of different options out there. And there are some differences between them. So they're actually into two different groups. So you've got these three, and then you've got these five. So the hormonal patch is a bit of a hybrid because it, it, there's two different options with it. And if I think about these three, talking about these three, they are um, combined forms of hormonal contraceptive, which means that they contain synthetic or exogenous um, or made outside the body hormone. So, but they contain both progesterone and um, estrogen. And because they contain both an estrogen and progesterone, they um, they lower or they suppress your natural levels of hormones. And then instead, you get the spike up and down of um, of hormone that is every day linked with the pill ingestion or the vaginal ring or the patch, depending on which one you're using. And then after, if this is the pill on the on the graph, this is what happens when you take the pill. Um, after 21 days, you have these seven days of um, kind of pill three or withdrawal bleed. And um, it's not the same as a period. I think it's really important to understand. So whilst I said menstruation, that's not trite and I did not make this graph, um, you have a withdrawal bleed. <clears throat> and uh, and then you, you start the whole thing again. So you have this hormonal um, contraceptive cycle, I guess. I can see the chat's going off, but I will come to it because I can't actually open it because I can't see my mouse. So I will come to you, I promise, if it's a question. Um, the other forms of um, contraception are progestin only. And so these um, only contain a progestin or progesterone. And because of that, estrogen might still fluctuate um, if you're using them. You might actually still ovulate, but don't worry, they're still 99% effective against pregnancy. And um, they just work in a slightly different way. And you can see on this graph here what I think is quite interesting. So the blue, the purple up and down is the amount of progesterone in the um, combined oral contraceptive ring. Um, and the blue line is um, the amount of progesterone that's in the Mirena coil or the hormonal IUD, um, same thing. And you can see from this that the level of progestin is much lower in that IUD. And that means it's got a much more localized effect and so doesn't affect your physiology in a different way. So we know that there's some symptoms that can be related to the pill, um, but actually we don't see that as much in IUD because of this much lower level of progestin. And the question I often get from hormone contraception users is why should I still monitor? Why should I track my periods? If it doesn't, I don't get a break, I don't get the same bleed or I don't get any symptoms. Why should I? It's not the same. And yes, actually some of the information in a Woman, particularly at the moment, um, might not apply to you, but it's still really important to track um, because you can get side effects from all of these contraception contraceptives. They are, in the, at the end of the day, kind of medical drugs. Um, they can also affect your physiology in different ways. They can affect your mood. They can affect um, things like muscle development. Um, they can affect uh, your heart rate variability, potentially. So recovery metrics. Um, so they can affect you. And it's important to be aware of that and to understand your body and tracking can, and monitoring can help you with that. And with those progestin only ones, particularly, you may still get this hormonal rhythm. So you may still actually have the fluctuation of hormones, just just a little bit lower level. So it's important to understand and to see whether that's going on in your body or not. 
we're all really sensitive to hormones in different ways. So we all metabolize um, hormones differently. We're all um, sensitive to, some people are more sensitive to estrogen, some people are more sensitive to progestin. So they get different symptoms or they react to contraceptives differently. And I think that's really important to um, be aware of when you're thinking about yourself, you can't compare yourself to your next door neighbor. Okay, I apologize for the speed of my um, speaking just then. Um, and I hope uh, that we'll have some good time for Zoom question and answer now. Um, but I guess the key takeaways from this that I want you to go home to so your homework is to track your cycle. Number one, if you're not already doing it, whether that's an app or that's a can using a calendar or a diary or a journal, you can track your cycle. And so then you can start to understand what each phase means for you, what your hormones mean for you. You can be aware if there are any red flags and ask for help if there is anything of concern don't be there's no silly kind of question around that you can be proactive around your symptoms so if you um see that realize that particular phases where you're not feeling so great well what can you do about it what is that symptom how can you be proactive how can you be prepared so that it doesn't hold you back so that eventually or at the end uh, essentially you can embrace your female superpower you can tap into it and you can achieve all you want to achieve and be at your best on any one given day and I thought I just I'm sorry my voice has just gone there we go um I thought I'd just finish with this little clip um from a soccer player over here called Millie Bright um, she plays for Chelsea, who are a team that we've worked with for a couple of, well, three years now. Um, and so I thought you'd take it from her if you don't think. You know, me. working out what phases I have the most symptoms in, um, what can be done to improve those symptoms. And yeah, just what that looks like for me on a personal note. At the start, it was actually a shock not understanding my cycle properly. In my head, I was like, part of me, and not understanding, I was like, oh, this could look like we're making excuses because we're female and oh, I can't do gym today because I'm in phase two or whatever it might be. But I think once you understand it, it's actually, it's not being used as an excuse. It's, it's there to help push you on and to just improve performance really and make you as comfortable as possible. There we go, from the horse's mouth. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And... Come back to Zoom. Um, it's, um, it's, that's absolutely uh, brilliant. I had a couple of, we have a couple of questions, a couple of yeah. comments. Some of them were sent into the chat. Some of them were sent in the Q&A because they kind of don't want to be open. And that's understandable as well, you know. Um, but I know there was a, a, just, I suppose, a good, actually, the most recent comment there, you probably able to see it yourself, is look, uh, really love the talk. Really, really interesting and important. Um, and the question there is, if the hormonal IUD has low levels of progesterone, which means which means it's mostly localized, is the hormone cycle is prominent? Yeah. In, yes, just that's a really good, um, really good question. In my experience, there's almost like two different categories of IUD users. There are IUD users that have this regular bleed, and those are um, users so I think it's like 70% of IUD users do so ovulate and so they do get this fluctuation of estrogen again it's just a little bit like less so you get this hormonal cycle we can't say for sure exactly what that is because it unfortunately the research is just not there and I I like I think it's very individual is one of the annoying things about being a pr practitioner and a researcher is that I just know that we're still behind in so many areas. Um, but in terms of being an athlete, I think it's it's almost like taking the information that's available for a non-hormonal contraceptive user and then just being like, okay, does that apply to me? Okay, yes, it does. Okay, that might be because my estrogen is higher. Um, but if it doesn't, then that's because it's, there's sli some slight suppression going on there. So sorry, that's not very specific. Um, you do also get IUD users that have a very much more irregular bleed. And so there I'd say that the um, hormone is, is much more suppressed, but it's about um, understanding what happens. Um, and in terms of adjustments, I, I can't be specific, unfortunately. It's, 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 very, um, it's very individual and personal. 
Yeah, just something that came in earlier in the chat, Esther, as well. Uh, it was around, um, I, suppose I probably forgot it myself that you were saying that this is an increased risk of in injury, I think, would that be right, for people who have maybe an irregular cycle, you know? Yeah. Um, and I suppose for someone who might have an irregular cycle, maybe they, they, you know, they don't have a bleed or and it's going on, or they're having a bleed for a long period of time. Like, what's the protocol for them? Like, because I'm conscious yeah. of people on each night maybe quite young. So like, it's to go to the GP or like, so just yeah. maybe a little bit of, just we don't mind talking about that a little bit maybe for us. Yeah, of course. So if you don't have a cycle that's regular um, or you notice that you've, um not had a bleed in maybe 90 days so three months that would be called a, like that's termed kind of amenorrheic um and i would go to your gp if you can go to a doctor you might unfortunately doctors don't get much education in this area um and the i've heard about lots of doctors that are like oh it doesn't matter you don't need to get pregnant you don't need to worry about that but i would push them for more support or for a referral and um, you can always get in touch with us if you're not really sure where to go to and um, it's about looking at those things those kind of stresses and if you need to be if you need to work maybe you might need to work with a nutritionist around it or a personal trainer to make sure your training load is really managed maybe you need to work with like a psych psychological support so like a therapist might help and um, because it's about knowing what that stressor is that's causing your in your cycle to be irregular but um yeah always make sure that you go to a gp first because there may be something underlying that is causing that um and then in terms of injury risk i think it's if you're like a coach say and you're working with an athlete who has an irregular cycle encouraging them, them to go to the gp but being aware that um that it can alter their physiology not having a very regular cycle and so um do you do you need to keep pushing them like what's how quick how much do they need to perform for you can they take a step back whilst they get the cycle sorted out and then kind of push on in training after that um if it's if they aim in a rate for a long period of time their bone mineral density is likely to be um impacted and so doing loading exercise is really good but just maybe not um maybe ensuring recovery um is really important you touched on something there earlier on as well and just there you kind of mentioned and if while you know you're not necessarily nutritious in your area i know um somebody had said earlier on and i actually don't myself to they just don't eat like fish. So I know you'd mentioned about yeah. the oily fish and okay. having that as part of a healthy and stable diet. Um, so just, would you have any, just even yourself, can you give recommendations for the maybe person who, who popped that into the q and or your Yeah. Of course. Um, it's a very common one. Lots of people don't like fish. Don't worry. Um, I, we, you can get fish oil supplements. So if you want to supplement, but make sure that you're getting it um, like, like batch tested good reputable source of supplementation um if you don't want to go down that route you can your body can convert a certain amount of um omega-3s from things like nuts seeds olive oils um kind of things like chia seeds are really high in omega-3s and it can convert some of that into the two types of omega-3 that we know are really good for inflammation so yeah that there would be the sources to go down at least I know uh, I'm big into my chia seeds, so uh, okay. <laughs> just uh, something as well that came up and was something myself that maybe I didn't fully get, but you had mentioned there about uh, a pre, you know, you know, a routine before bed, maybe pre-bed, pre, -bed, um, pre -bed protein with berries. So you talk in there about kind of specifically like something like a protein yogurt or yeah yeah so i mean greek yogurt is high in protein naturally um and also it's high in a type of protein that we know is really good for like muscle development so from an athletic point of view is is great it's not just a menstrual cycle thing um but in towards the end of the cycle your protein um demands slightly increase anyway so uh, yeah having some some Greek yogurt, you can stir some extra protein in, or you can have like one of the, you know, like the skier yogurts that are high in protein. Um, they're great. And then you can top it up with, yeah, like cherries are really good before bed or like berries, anything that's got loads of antioxidants in. Um, well, it's like a match made in heaven, the two of them together. I have never heard that before, even myself. So I think I mean, yeah. uh, it was commented around. So it was great. Even just that little nugget, Esther, for people 
Um, it was fantastic. Uh, there was a couple of other bits that I took a couple of notes. Um, yeah, just I've just seen Suzanne's um, chat. chat. Yeah, what would you recommend? Who would you recommend covers this subject with your players? Physio, doctor, can a female? But yeah, I I think if you as a female coach, if you're um, well read in the area and you feel confident, I think yes, um, open that conversation up. Um, offer advice. I think we need to get comfortable in talking about it. Um, and I think also you can let players know that you know. You, you, you're aware it's a really important subject you're not an expert but you do know a bit and so you can help them from that point of view I think they, they could probably really appreciate that um but physios doctors like all of the above I think that's we work with lots of teams and we try to have this kind of multi multidisciplinary approach so that everyone is just talking about menstrual cycles as if they're um you know a natural they're another part of being an athlete or of being a female that doesn't have to be like a oh let's all just sit down and talk about periods because I think that can be quite overwhelming um but yeah just and and some things like having the terminology of phase one two three and four can just facilitate that because you don't have to say oh yeah I'm bleeding you can say I'm on phase one which removes some of that maybe taboo in in lots of people's minds Fantastic. Um, they were the kind of comments that came in, and I just want to uh, just I just made a couple of one or two notes myself. Yeah, of course, because I suppose I probably don't enough myself, and I am very conscious. But just as well, the importance of sleep in terms of helping maybe regulate things as well. Um, you know, I suppose people need a certain amount of time. But is there just to go back? Is there a particular time in particular during those phases that it's maybe a little bit more important, or is it just throughout? Or what's your um so sleep, sleep is always important um unfortunately we live in a culture where that's not always appreciated um but i think getting eight hours is really important for lots of things not just from recovery from exercise we know that sleep disturbances are much more common um in the second half of the cycle phase so phases three and four um so that's why things like that sleep routine, that pre-bed yoga pot can help with those. Um, but actually, yeah, sleep demands may slightly increase in phase four and phase one um, because your body in those phases is just working so hard, um, dealing with this decline in hormone and then shedding the endometrium. And so that we know your energy demand increases and therefore your sleep demand increases alongside that. Um, so I, if you if you need, like, if you want to prioritize certain times, then they would be the ones to go, go down. Fantastic. I think we've probably covered most of the cute, the questions and maybe comments that came in. But maybe just to, before we maybe finish up, just if, if anybody else has any other comments or questions uh, to pop in to, to do it now, um, especially with someone um, as fantastic as Esther on with such great knowledge. Um, just for my own end, look, I've, you know, I had actually only downloaded the app recently. And I have to say, like, from my point of view, like when I was playing, you know, like we've a lot of players on here tonight. And like when I was playing myself, you know, um, you know, in my teens and in my twenties and playing, then kind of moving up the levels of the grade, you know, I, that information wasn't there. So no, I know. yeah, I think if the people can can download the app and just for themselves, you know, there's a couple of nice little pieces of things I wouldn't have been aware of. So I definitely would encourage people to do that because it's really, really good and. Look, it's definitely given my ideas even for more talk tonight around educating maybe on a wider sense. But I think for the players that are on tonight, I know there's a couple of coaches, hopefully you've got a huge amount from it. I will leave the last word with you, but just want to obviously thank yourself, Esther. And I want to thank all of you who've come on tonight. Uh, the webinar is pre-recorded, so we are is recorded, so we will make this available on our YouTube channel in the, the coming days. So Look, I yeah, we have uh, another question in there. So if you want to take that yeah. as well, I mean that's a really good, um, Adrian. That's a really good point. Um, and we do actually have like a younger, um, targeted uh, presentation, um, that we do with kind of some of the academy players and youth players that we work with. So, um, I think that's a really good point. And maybe if you feed that back to the powers that be at the LGFA, then uh, we can get that sorted.
Um, I have also just left my email address and our social media handle in the chat box. So if anyone has any other questions or wants to get in contact, then feel free to send me an email. Fantastic. Okay. Um, again, thanks, Megan, Esther. Thank you very much. And um, look, everyone else have a have a really really good evening. And hopefully, we'll we'll see you all again on another uh, on the next webinar as part of the series. All right. Take care, everybody. Take, thanks, Megan. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.